wrong there. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Michal Butler. I'm a postgraduate student uh, in archaeology in the University of York. Um, and today we're going to do a playthrough of Far Cry Primal. Um, hi, I'm Nikki Milner. I'm a professor here in the Department of Archaeology and my specialism is the Mesolithic. Hi, I'm Julian Carty and I'm on a placement year with the Post Glacial Project. I'm Matthew Collins and I am a bioarchaeologist. Oh, I'm Neil DeVoe, I'm a computing officer for the Department of Archaeology. And I'm Colleen Morgan, a postdoc associate lecturer, and I'll be mostly invisible for this time. <laughs> okay, so for today's playthrough, we're going to do it in two parts. So for the first 20 minutes, half an hour, I'm going to go from the very, very start of the game, uh, kind of work through some of the story uh, mode there, and then I'm going to transfer over to a, an account where we played through for about nine or ten hours. And I'm going to see how some of the concepts and stuff progress through the game. So let's get started. A new game, and I'll put it on easy mode. So firstly we have to uh, sit through a countdown from uh, 2016 all the way back to uh, 10,000 BC. And also we'll have a lot of freedom as well to talk over this because uh, it's a totally new constructed language so everything's subtitled with a completely different language. Uh, which was done by the Linguistics College I believe in London. Uh, so we kind of kind of looking at some uh, proto-European languages and actually constructed a whole new language just for the game. And also the um, skin attached. That's true. Yeah, those cave paintings are a bit more sophisticated. Pa well, I suppose a bit more Paleolithic like. And spotted by some rather spotted hole. Just wait for the mammoth then to come. <laughs> <laughs> Shaman. Yeah. The trouble with this is that I, the last time I played a computer game was in 1980, which was Fogger, I think. Oh, you may so changed a yeah, bit. I'm a bit wet. It's like into the cinema for me. <laughs> but it's interesting. They're trying to immerse us in this world, right? They're telling us yeah. backstory, why we're yeah. here. We've, they've reversed from 2016 to the Mesolithic. <laughs> But already in the introduction, we're seeing some Paleolithic elements. Um. Pretty late mammoths. Yeah. Especially in Central Europe, for example. Yeah, well, in Central Europe, yeah. yeah, definitely. Bow's far too big. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this is just still backstory, isn't it? Yeah, this is, yeah. yeah so they're, yeah. Um, they're trekking to their, their homeland, I think it's Oris, because um, their tribe has been scattered 
kind of around the centre of there, trying to get back home. Okay. So when you start playing, you're trying to get back home, basically, are you? Or um, survive? Essentially, yeah. But yeah, it still includes Neanderthal. It has a version of Neanderthal in it, isn't it? It's slightly, obviously, inaccurate. But... Okay. We've been told we need to boost yes, our, mic boost our volume. microphone. Uh, perhaps talk louder. Talk louder, okay. Yeah, because okay. I think it's a fixed volume on the mic. So yeah, talk louder, talk, lean real close to that. Okay. <laughs> So how often would hunters be um, taking on full-sized mammoths, uh, three or four of them at a time? Uh, well, not yeah, not taking on mammoths in the in the Mesolithic. No. <laughs> and yes, hafting technologies. Doesn't seem unreasonable. No. I mean, this is the interesting thing, because you've seen things that we don't actually see, you, you know, you're not going to get that evidence in the ground. We don't have, we don't get full uh, spears like that, sadly. Yeah. Especially with the hacking which you're using mm. Makes sense, yeah. but I don't know if there's much evidence really. Well, I think there's always the assumption that people will go for the, you know, the big animals, but you do, you do find, um, well, for the Mesolithic, for the red deer, you find them of all ages, all sides, and obviously they're going to be, yes, getting what opportunistic, isn't it? Partly. Wild animals take the youngest. Speak up. Yeah. And so a lot more trapping and fishing and, and bunny hunting and uh, whatnot. <laughs> I like the I like the way they've used a number of different. You know, they've got communal hunting and they've got different people. Um, oh, I get it. So that, that's a saber tooth. Saber -tooth. Sadly, yes. saber tooth never got along with humans. And as soon as you find humans in Europe or in North America, once you get other big cats. You lose the same two, so we don't really know why. It's curious, presumably because it's a, it's a, um, it's, a, it's kind of predation mechanism means it won't work very well against humans. In the sense of. So essentially now what's happening? So most of your hunting party has been killed now. And and end up being on your own, trying to survive. Oh, right, okay. Okay, so the, if we hit the options, there might be a master volume for audio. 20% lower should be about right. Yeah, so let's check on this quick. Sorry, guys, one second. Not that size. Yeah. Some places. Tigers. Mm. Unless he means the saber tooth. Saber tooth, yeah. Yes. 
Okay, so now, yeah, you're now alone, uh, trying to find your way back to this Auris land where your people live. So now you've got to collect resources. So we've got to get wood, reeds, and slate uh, in order to craft a bow and arrow. And a pendant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is he taking Alder for his boat now? Yeah. We don't know what he's taking for his boat. Alder wood. Uh, maybe some of our reeds over here. So this is nice, because often in games you'll just come across weapons that are already made, that are just on the ground for some strange reason, so you actually yeah. have to put them together. Yeah, so this game is purely you have to craft everything uh, from scratch, you don't actually find any weapons at all and everything has to be crafted, and then you get upgrades as you go along, collecting uh, certain resources in the landscape and you can upgrade your weapons uh, with that. Now I have everything collected. A little much like so slate, that was just schist you took. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting actually because this seems to have pockets of flint within the slate as well. Alright. Uh, I don't know much about that. What? But no geologist yeah. was involved no. in making <laughs> <laughs> So where would you usually find flint? Uh, chalk? Yeah, chalk or um, uh, on the beach as cobbles, yeah. Or if you're lucky enough in the volcanic area you might have obsidian. Mm. Mm. In Tenerife, there's only, I think, two quarries, only one's very good. And now we have our bow. So two parts to the bow. So comp it's composite, by looks for yeah. yeah. Which I think is fairly late, composite yeah. bows. Yeah, so, so now we uh, have to hunt now, oh. our bow to, uh, to eat and regain health. Um, Interesting aspect of this is when you actually hunt and you injure an animal, it'll run off, but then you can choose this new hunter vision and you can actually track the animal uh, as it's been, as it's running away and actually been injured until it eventually dies. Do you presume that would be the main hunting strategy mm. that humans yeah. used? That's what I mean, seeing that, that take down a mammoth like that, I doubt they would have taken them down, they would have injured it and then mm. yeah. followed it. Yeah, so this is now our hunter vision. <coughs> Ooh, so specialist vision. Mm. We can find anything. Oh, there's a oh, yeah. right there. So. That'd be quite handy if you had a <laughs> hunter vision. But I mean, we hunter gatherers probably did see their read their landscape, no, see their landscape either, much yeah. better. Yeah, it's notice true. things. So now it's injured. We can follow his blood trail. Where'd he go? Yeah, it seems to just stop there. Oh, really? Well, that's a shame. Let's <laughs> <laughs> get another one. That's all. Oh, here's the little splatter again. Oh, here he is. Okay, we found him. Ah. So you can skin it. Yeah, and you collect resources from it, so you get your arrow back and meat and uh, skin and, uh, and, and then uh, uh, hide as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the fastest processing of an animal. Yeah. I know, I was <laughs> <just> thinking <laughs> of it. <laughs> I was hoping to see the, the gore bits. Yeah, skinning was a fairly long winded and tedious process. Mm -hmm. Well, not, re not removing the skin, but the subsequent process. So you might have tried to stash it and come back to it later, or done a very minimalistic processing on it. Yeah. Yeah, you can only carry, carry so much around the landscape. So it's not encouraging you to like find a shelter or... No, not just yet. So once I actually got, um, got these three goats, then we'll start to get uh, turn to night and then we'll to find shelter and create fire. And 
It's that Santa's still in training mode, right? Yeah, pretty much. This is probably one of the most tedious parts actually in the whole game, this initial hunting the three goats. <laughs> it's gotta be three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How a lot of goats around, not that by the way. Goats as well, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's goats yeah. unusual. Well, I mean, I guess it could be some kind of wild ibex as well. Mm. Yeah. Good what, they are. what would you be expecting in terms of fauna at this time? Deer would be the big one <coughs> in northern Europe, yeah. yeah. Red deer, yeah. wild boar, uh, wild cow. Yeah. Um, what predators would you have? Wolves, bears, lynx. Yeah, I know there is, we do have deer in the game and wild boar as well, but then there's, they have then the megafauna again, I think there's a woolly rhinoceros in it as well. Mm. Some kind of bizarre, and I think yaks as well. It's, sure. it's strange in a sense they chose 10,000 mm. and didn't choose the transition from Neanderthals to moderns. Mm. Yeah. Which have been, and you could have gone from, North, as you travel through Europe, you go from ice and snow down to most warmer climates. And then you've actually got the two races of humans as well. Yeah, funny again mentioning that. Actually, within the game, there's a. They seem to be morphologically different races again yeah. within humans. I gather this game. one is supposed yeah. to be a Neanderthal type. Ex yeah, exactly. Too late. Yeah. yeah. So we have a question: How common was consumption of raw meat and fats during this period? Did early humans not get sick with parasites and disease often? Uh, Good question. We think that people probably actually uh, cooked meat because there's plenty of evidence of fire, and um, but that that's the difficult thing. You don't. Re it's really hard to know exactly how they did how did how they did cook things, and whether they did eat things raw, uh, and also we don't know whether people got sick with things like that. Unfortunately, fats. We know that a lot of groups, particularly when it's cold, so in the higher latitudes, fats are a very, they almost become a very attractive thing to eat and so people can consume large amounts of fat. One of the problems with fat is again, processing fat usually requires heat and also then as you convert fats to oils, liquid, liquidize them, we need vessels in which to keep them. Yeah. And at this point we have no ceramic technology of course. Yeah. Well we would if we were in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> I think, not in Europe. I think in the game there's ceramics. Yeah. Well, yeah. they came from Japan yeah. earlier then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so now, craft a club, which initially it actually just looks like a hafted axe. Mm. They've interestingly decided to call it a club. Mm. The point about parasites is a good Ooh. one. Sorry. We, have no, we, have no, we could get to know from, if we found coprolites, we might be able to find that to be evidence of parasites. We haven't found much good evidence of coprolites, that's faecal matter. Uh, there has been a recent paper on Neanderthal faeces, but we haven't seen physical evidence of parasites within them. We suspect they would have carried quite a high parasite burden. Mm. Actually, Martin Bowlett in the Seven Estuary found um, evidence where they thought they were going to the toilet. All oh, right, okay. From, I think yeah, no. from some kind of parasites. Yeah. And certainly, Einara Sistiaga at MIT um, has been looking at sediments within Neanderthal deposits in cave sequences to detect the presence of Neanderthal fecal matter. Um, and because that's linked to micromorphology, you could see evidence of, of, of eggs, for instance, a trichuris or something. Mm. So we have another question about uh, the cowrie shell wrist wraps. Accurate, appropriate, fashion forward? Question <laughs> mark. <laughs> Uh, you do get some cowries from some Mesolithic sites, but they tend to be really little ones. Um, the European ones are very, very small. So, uh, and those ones look more like the ones that you get um, used as um, money in historical periods. So, uh, to some degree accurate. I mean, they were using, they were, they, uh, they did have jewellery. Yeah. They were making beads, but quite often out of uh, teeth, out of animal teeth. And then at coastal sites, you also get them from turreted gastropods as well. Yeah. Yeah. What is a turreted gastropod for our audience, Matthew? Uh, the shells that you see on the beach. They're sort of like the little snail shell type things. So, yeah, that's sort of 
yeah. snail shell as opposed to a cowrie, although they actually are quite closely related. <laughs> Thank you. They look different. So fire seems quite instrumental to this game. Uh, especially at night now, because we see we have wolves lurking around, so it's kind of one of the things actually deter them uh, at night is fire. And you see them probably go for me now. It looks quite a lot like a dial, that one. <laughs> Big bugger. <laughs> so from the wrong continent. We did, uh, we did find a wolf bone at Star Car. But we've also found dog as well. They did have dog then, domesticated dog. Yeah, they had dog quite early. Yeah. Uh, dog, I mean, there are, this has a beast master mode, but I guess it's not dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> saber tooth tigers and yeah. bears and yeah, so kind of wolves. You yeah, can, yeah, yeah wolves. as well. Yeah. All right, we have another question from our audience. Um, howdy all. How do you think the 3D reconstruction of the landscape and the way you have have to traverse it affects our engagement with the vision of the past, as well as the separation between different anthropological cultures? I think the um, it's really it's quite fascinating to watch this because as an archaeologist, you're not really thinking about how people will move across the landscape or you know dark, at night time or daytime, and uh, it is it is making us think about what evidence we have and what evidence we don't have. It's not the kind of um, at the moment what we're looking at is not the landscape that we research here at York. We're looking at um, the area around Scarborough in North Yorkshire, which is quite different from this. Uh, but even so, it's still um, now being in a cave, there's plenty of evidence in Europe of people using caves and so on. It make it, yeah, it makes it more, it gives you a different perspective. I found that quite a bit with doing three, 3D reconstructions myself, is that it, it, raises, it always raises more questions mm. than it answers. To be honest, it's a really good tool to think with um, because you have to add, add that detail. You have to add, well, you think, okay, were there rats in the cave? Yes, there probably were rats. You know, we have evidence of rats, so. But, yeah, rats tend to like, and rat, rats and mice tend to like a lot of the human settlement, so mm. yes, I mean, you haven't got much of what <coughs> food things that rats would like in that cave. I think, I think what will be interesting is when we move towards a more immersive technology. So there's the, the HTC Vive, Oculus type technology, and then actually move beyond that and we start moving to augmented reality. I think those could be quite interesting, archaeologically speaking, particularly augmented reality, where you actually could be at a site like Star Car, but you actually could be then imagining what it would be like as a lakescape. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it, it's an interesting way for archaeologists to rethink a site. And you can imagine that, let's say there's been a, a new 3D construction reconstruction of Rome has been generated recently and Rome with augmented reality would be a very interesting place to visit. Yeah. So you could walk around it. Yeah, so, you basically, so you, you've got the real Rome in front of you but then you lay, overlay it so you're seeing through it with augmented reality what it would have been like at different times. Ooh, there's a person. Yeah. Yes, we have found, a, found, someone. found someone. Yes, Matthew, I definitely agree. Mm. So AR rather than VR I think is a really exciting way forward for us. Mm. Oh dear. Yeah, so he's in the Andertal yeah. light with the eye yeah, the, yeah. the, the, the nose and the, uh, the brit. And she's taking trophies. <laughs> so they call saber tooth time. Yeah, so oh dear. Yeah. Makes you remember that life was probably fairly gruesome at times mm. in the in the past. Yeah, true. <coughs> and it's really interesting to think why ambush predators like saber tooths actually went extinct so much earlier than the other big cats. They just saber tooths and Neanderthals seem to occupy such a similar niche that they don't they don't. Once you get humans into Europe, you lose the saber tooths. It's really curious. Yeah. And the same thing happens in North America. So we have another question. Is there any substance to the idea that the Neanderthals were more intelligent than us on an individual level? Wouldn't that have led to them being more adaptable than us, or does that hinge more on social factors? 
well, they have bigger brains, so you could argue that if you, if you, if you quote brain subjects as very dangerous with intelligence, you could say yes, but I think what's interesting about humans is they don't have to be as intelligent because they're definitely more social, and what we understand is that the larger a group is, the larger that combined knowledge is, and I think that's a great success of humans. It's that social aspect, and what we think about Neanderthals is they worked in much smaller groups, like Penny Spikins' work, and therefore they were less keen to, to, to communicate with each other. And as we get more genetic data, we should be able to see that more clearly, comparing modern humans with Neanderthals, and how much we see runs of homozygosity, of so genetic identity within Neanderthals, indicating levels of inbreeding. So even if they were smarter than us, you'd argue that our more social character would overcome that. But we don't really know if they were smarter than us or not. Um, there is a big question over when Neanderthals first meet modern human technology, how quickly they adopt to it. No pendant, but she's wearing ears. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're talking about is there's a, a very um, interesting pendant that was just uh, released to the media, um, or the earliest instance of uh, art, Mesolithic art, in the UK. Mm. Yeah. So Google star car pendant if you're curious. Oh, we got another question? And keep on speaking up, guys, because okay, yeah. the audio is bit bad. How often did early humans venture out at night to hunt and scavenge? Further, did early humans operate on the same night-day cycle as we do? That's a very good question. It's almost, a, well, it's in, probably impossible to answer from uh, the archaeology. There's a, the, the only thing I can think of that sort of relates to that is there's a, pay, there's, um, a site up in Scotland where... They think that they found all these um, post holes, which look like they align to um, something to do with either the the sun rising or the or the moon possibly. There's definitely some kind of link to lunar cycles, and so they're obviously aware of the what's going on at night and the lunar cycles. It's almost a bit like a it's some kind of um, maybe marker of time, but whether they actually went out and hunted and things that's something we don't we can't really tell from the archaeology so not physiological evidence of neanderthals maybe being nocturnal as well the big eyes in the occipital bun and all that with the visual cortex and stuff possibly that... i'm not i'm no expert on neanderthals i have to say matthew nor knows am i you about. need to like pull a higgins here to yeah. answer my question here yeah we should have um one thing we can say is that um spotted horses which today the mutation of good spotting is also good poor night vision. They seem to have been hunted to extinction very quickly, and so it might be argued that hunting at dusk <coughs> might have been somewhere where you had a real advantage over those horses which have a particular mutation producing um, the pigment uh, associated with um, uh, the, the spotting colour and also it impacts on, on night vision. So the, they went, they go early, so maybe that indicates we were hunting at dusk. Mm -hmm. But we don't know. Um, so now I think it might be a good time to change over between uh, the two different kind of gameplay accounts. So this kind of becomes your permanent base and a village builds up around this. So I'll change over to uh, my other gameplay account and actually see the village kind of uh, how it is uh, a lot further on in the game. So we are going to take a quick break.